Well, good morning. It is so wonderful to be here. Um, always grateful for the opportunity to come and to share um, with those who pray for us, who partner with us. Um, we are so appreciative. And, you know, we always like to give a token of our appreciation. And so this time I brought a gift, but I'm really excited about that gift, this gift. Not because of what it is in and of itself, but because of what it actually represents. So this is coffee, so hopefully there are some coffee drinkers in here. But this, so probably about five years ago, I started mentoring a young leader. Uh, he was just entering into the ministry. And I've worked for, with him over the past five years. Well, about two years ago, he really felt the Lord leading him to step away from his position at the church where he was to start a new ministry called the South African Renewal Network. And one of the things that he does is help to plant microchurches. So these are churches of 10 to 20 people. But because he recognized that in a lot of the townships and the places, like the gospel wasn't penetrating. Um, there just weren't churches. And so um, he developed this. And over the past two years, they've actually planted probably about six churches, six microchurches. But as because he left his position at the church, he was no longer getting a salary. And so one of the things that he decided to do in order to help support his family and his ministry was to connect with a local coffee roaster and to begin packaging and selling coffee. And so we thought, what a wonderful way to support this guy who's in ministry doing church planting, but also to say thank you to those who are supporting us. And so it's a full circle. And so thank you so much again for your prayers, for your financial support. And as you drink this coffee, remember Grant Porthen and the work of his ministry as well as the ministry of East Mountain. So thank you. Well, before I enter into the ward, I just want to give you a brief update on my family. So we are here in the States, have been here since May, uh, because our oldest son, Dylan, graduated from high school and then began uh, his first year at University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And so we thought it's a good idea to be kind of close as he's adjusting. Uh, neither of our boys have really lived in the States at all. Uh, Dylan was born in Senegal, Caleb was born in South Carolina, but you know they lived practically their whole lives overseas. And so it, it has been good to be here with him. Uh, I think it's definitely been a support. It's helped him to kind of find his feet and, and to be able to, to just do well. And so we're grateful for that. Our youngest son, Caleb, who is 16, uh, has, is trying to get his driver's license. Unfortunately, with the change in the laws, he's got to do eight month or nine months of practice before he can actually get his license. And so that's made it a little bit challenging because... Um, will be heading back before he can actually take his test, but he may stay for the summer to work, and so that could give him an opportunity to go ahead and take his driver's test. And then Marcy and I both recognize God's sovereignty in the timing of our being here. Um, as you know, Marcy's dad passed away last April, and it's really been a rough season for her mom. She's just experienced a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. And so for Marcy to be able to be here um, to help her mom in this season. So we're about an hour and a half from where she lives, so Marcy drives up once a week, uh, spends a day with her. Sometimes she'll spend the night. But just, you know, that to be here for our parents, and my mom as well, who, you know, as you know, lived in Brookville. Uh, but in September, we moved her to be with my sister in Virginia, which has been a really good move. Uh, it's hard. My mom, you know, misses here. She misses her friends and uh, everything, and yet recognizing that it's been just health-wise, uh, mentally, it's been a good move for her. And so we are very grateful that we could be here in this season for our moms uh, like that and re recognize God's sovereignty in that. As I mentioned, we're planning to head back in June. Uh, we'll be getting our tickets soon. And But one thing to pray for, two years ago, our whole visa si situation was kind of a mess. You know, I ended up getting my visa. Marcy and Dylan did not get their visas because for whatever reasons, they decided to process each application individually instead of together as a family. So we're still sorting that out. But Marcy, on March 12th, 
uh, will be going up to the embassy in New York to submit her visa application. And so just praying that that would all come together and work out so that she can have her visa. So um, this morning I want to spend some time in Matthew chapter 9. And, you know, as I was thinking about this, have you ever been in a crowd before? You know, maybe you've gone to a baseball game or a football game, a large group of people. You know, Marcy and I had an opportunity to go to a Panthers game before the end of the season. Now, it was the Panthers, so of course it wasn't a huge crowd. But it was, you know, you see all these people in the stadium, and it's, it's just a mass of people. You know, they're all cheering or they're all yelling at the ref or, you know, doing what people do in a crowd. And yet, when you're in that crowd, have you ever stopped to think about the individuals that are there? Have you ever noticed particular people? Have you ever thought about the story of those people? Well, Matthew chapter 9, the first 34 verses are really a snapshot of the crowd. We're getting a glimpse of the people that Jesus is talking about once we get to verse 35. Now, context, you know, this is in the early part of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Um, and so here are these snapshots of the crowd that he is interacting with as he goes about. And it shows us his interaction with these people and their responses. And so Matthew, 30, Matthew chapter 9, from verse 35, I'll read. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, first we see these crowds that Jesus is talking about. And as I mentioned in that snapshot, we see a glimpse of the broken, of the grieving, of the questioning and doubting, of the desperate. Now, I wish we had the time to read through all of Matthew 9 and just look at this, but I really encourage you, maybe this afternoon as you go home, take some time to look at this passage and to get a good glimpse of what Jesus is dealing with here. You know, because in verse 2, for example, we see the broken. We see the paralytic. Now, here's a man, he's, he's helpless, he's laying on a mat, he's physically broken. And then there are his friends, who I believe are desperate to get help for their friend. And so they bring him to Jesus on his mat, and the, the, the Mark chapter 2 tells us that the, the crowds are so, there's so many people, they can't get to Jesus, and so what do they do? They climb up on the roof, they break a hole in the roof, and they lower their friend down to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds pretty desperate. But not only do you have the desperate, you have the questioning. In verse 14, there are John's disciples who come to Jesus asking a question. Jesus, you know, the Pharisees are saying this. John is teaching us this. You're doing this. You know, what, what do we do? What's right? They're questioning. They have doubts. But then as well, you see another desperate person, the woman, in verse 20. She's been bleeding for 12 years. Mark chapter 5 tells us that she had spent all that she had on the doctors, and she was suffering at the hand of the doctors. I don't know if you've ever experienced chronic illness, but sometimes it seems like it's the doctors that are making us suffer. So here's a woman who has been desperate, suffering for 12 years. And then, of course, let's not forget the grieving. The synagogue official in verse 18, he comes to Jesus because his daughter has just died. He's grieving, he's desperate, he's crying out for help. 
Jesus sees this crowd and he says that they are like sheep without a shepherd. Now think about that for a second. Sheep without a shepherd, they're unable to fend for themselves. They are in danger of being devoured. And so here are these people that Jesus sees and he says, they are like sheep without a shepherd, in danger of being devoured by the religious system, by all the rules and regulations, devoured by the the world and everything that it would put before them. They are in danger. And when Jesus sees this crowd, he's filled with compassion. Now, that shouldn't surprise us. In the passage, well, John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And even in the passage that we read in Exodus 34, uh, it tells us when God appeared to Moses on the mountain, he declared his name, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. And so it makes perfectly good sense that when Jesus looks at the crowd, he sees the same thing that his father does. And he's filled with compassion. But it's compassion that leads to action. Compassion isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling. But when we see Jesus filled with compassion, he always does something. And yet, as we look in this passage, the action that Jesus takes is not the action that we would necessarily expect. And I can imagine the disciples hearing Jesus say that the the harvest is plentiful, that these sheep without a shepherd, that they would say, okay, Jesus, you just need to get back out there. You need to go do more. You need to take fewer breaks, you know, and, and just get this done. And yet, that's not what Jesus does. Because when he looks out at the people, he also sees that the harvest is plentiful. Now, what's he talking about? What does he mean the harvest is plentiful? Well, it only makes sense if you think about it in light of the bigger picture. Now, where does a harvest come from? Well, somebody goes out, they plow a field, they plant the seeds, they water, they protect, they pull the weeds... And eventually in time, there's a harvest that's ready to be collected. And so Jesus is looking at this crowd in light of the bigger picture. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, tells us this. And this is about the end of things. And he says, after these things I looked... And behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all the tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb." And so here's a large multitude of people standing in heaven from every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping God. Because from the beginning of creation, God has been at work to bring forth a harvest from every nation and tribe and tongue. And so when Jesus sees these people, he recognizes That they're not just the broken and the desperate and the questioning. But amongst those people are those who are ready to be harvested and brought into the kingdom. Because that's been God's design and God's desire from the very beginning of creation. And he says the harvest is plentiful. You know, very often we don't see the individual in the crowd. We don't see the person in need. Or if we do, we think, oh, that person doesn't, you know, they don't need Jesus. They're not interested. They're doing this. They're doing that. And, and so we, we walk away. And yet Jesus saw the harvest ready to be picked. 
One example of that we see actually in verse 9 with Matthew. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. When you think about a tax collector, especially for a Jew to be a tax collector, that meant he had turned his back on everything that he knew. His people, his culture, his family, because the Jews hated tax collectors. Why? Because they were cooperating with the enemy. And so Matthew was a desperate man. For whatever reason, he was desperate enough to turn his back on everything he knew, everything he'd been taught, in order to work for the Romans. And so here comes Jesus, and he says simply to Matthew, follow me. Matthew jumps up, leaves everything to follow Jesus. He was desperate, but the harvest It was plentiful. You know, a few months before Marcy and I left from South Africa, we had an opportunity. Uh, A lady called up my wife uh, that she had met just a few weeks before. And she said, my my nephew is desperate. He needs to talk to somebody. Uh, Would you please meet with him? And so we arranged to meet with him at KFC, uh, which wasn't too far from where they lived. And so we're sitting there, and this young man walks in, and he sits down in front of us, and he just begins to pour out his heart. You know, he, he didn't have any friends, he didn't have a job, didn't have any prospects of a job, his girlfriend has, had just left him, and he was feeling hopeless, feeling desperate, like there was nothing left for him in life. And I sat there, and I looked at this young man, and I said, I know someone who cares very much about you. And I laid out the gospel, and I shared what Jesus had done for him. And there in KFC, this young man gave his life to Jesus. Because the harvest is plentiful. And yet Jesus saw the plentifulness of the harvest. And he said, but the workers are few. And here's the irony of that statement. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, full of the Spirit, who's preaching and teaching and healing and doing all those things. And yet he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, we often expect that God will do everything. And yet Jesus said the greatest need of these people, this crowd that he's seeing was not for him to be there doing more, but it was for workers to be sent out into their midst. You know, the second irony of this passage of Jesus' statement that the workers are few is that he doesn't then turn to the disciples and say, okay, you guys need to get out there and get to work. What he actually says to them is, you need to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Why does he do that? Why would he tell them to pray before they get sent out? Well, I think the first reason is to let us know that it's not dependent upon us. It's dependent upon God. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one who planted and who cultivated and who nurtures. And so it's his harvest field. He's the one that sends out workers. But secondly, I think Jesus said that because he wants us to remember the order of things. If we look in Mark chapter 3, in verse 14, when Jesus calls the disciples from verse 13, it says, And he went up on the mountain and summoned those who he himself wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed them twelve so that they would be with him, and he could send them out to preach. So Jesus' very first 
desire in calling the disciples was that they would be with him. Well, why did they need to be with him? Because we are broken people living in a broken world. And we need Jesus' transforming work in our lives. So that when he sends us out to do the things we, he wants us to do, we can do it in the way that he wants it to be done. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I think the last reason Jesus puts it in this order is because he wants us all to be able to get into the game. You know, there's some who would say, oh, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't, sh- I, I'm not Billy Graham. I can't, you know, share my faith like other people do. I can't, pre-, but Jesus says, hey, we can all get on our knees. We can all go before the Father and ask him to send out workers. But if you read farther into Matthew chapter 10, you see that just after Jesus tells the disciples to pray, they themselves get sent out to be workers into the harvest field. And so the starting point is to go before God. That's the place where we experience transformation. The very first way that we can be with Jesus is by talking with him, just sitting in his presence in prayer. That's a place of transformation of our hearts. That's a place where God prepares us to go out into the harvest field. You know, it's easy for us sometimes when we have a need, when there's something that we want, we're quick to go to God and to ask. And yet when God wants something, are we willing as eager to go and to ask him for what he wants? Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But you know, responding to that call is not about getting on a plane and going to another country. It's about making disciples as we go. It's not about being a missionary like Paul or an evangelist like Billy Graham. But it's like about taking to heart the other verse that we read this morning, Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance that we might walk in them. God has gifted each one of us. God has given each one of us certain experiences, certain skills, certain knowledge that is useful in the kingdom. And so when we're ready, when we're willing to join God first by going before him in prayer, and then willing to be available for him to use whatever it is that he's given us, he will use that to build his kingdom. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, this passage has become very important to me over the past four or five months. And one of the reasons for that is because as I I look at my own journey into the harvest field, you know, later I'll tell you the story of how I actually got into the ministry, but... You know, the fact that I had a dream of working for NASA, and I was actually headed there. Uh, I was on the stepping stone of an internship and a position with General Electric in their aerospace division that gave me a job after I graduated. And so I was on the road to where I wanted to go. And yet I recognized that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's why we do what we do. But that's also why East Mountain exists as a ministry. See, East Mountain is a transformational community that exists to disciple Christian leaders in partnership with the church 
for global missional service. We have a dream of seeing people transformed by the gospel, living a kingdom-minded life who inspire others to join with God in his work across Africa. And it's been exciting as we do that. We have two pathways that we use. One is uh, actually one that we've actually launched this year. Um, The principles of it have been part of what we've done, but we've made it a program called the Trek. And the Trek is a one to two year relational investment into a church where we come alongside them and help them to disciple leaders within their church. And at the same time, we help to equip mentors and facilitators who can continue to come alongside of people in a discipleship process. And the Trek makes use of a 21-day, 21-session curriculum called The Journey. And The Journey helps people answer the question of who is God, who am I, and how do I fit into what he's doing in the world? We've been working with a group of leaders uh, in a township called Lavender Hill, uh, walking them through this process. And it's been amazing to see how God is using it in their lives after actually only just about four months that we've been working with them. And so we're excited to see what God does with this as we come alongside of churches in a discipleship process to help them begin to better disciple people within their churches to hopefully see workers raised up and sent into the harvest field. Well, the other pathway that we have is our residency program, which traditionally has been a 10-month program where we invite young leaders to come into community where they study the scriptures, they learn the big story of the Bible, God's working to bring in a harvest of people from every nation. They study spiritual life and formation, how we grow in our relationship with Christ and how he, transformation comes about. You know, they're doing practical ministry. They're learning about leadership and ministry skills. Um, over the course of their internship, they have a mentor and they're involved in practical ministry in a church or in another organization so that they're actually putting into practice the things that they're learning. And God has been using the residency program, in amazing ways. I'm just going to share one or two stories, but again, over lunch, I'll share some more. One amazing story of a young man named Sia. Sia came into East Mountain. He'd had a really difficult um, upbringing, Uh, grew up without a father, and his grandmother raised him until he was about 12 or 13, and then he moved to Cape Town area to live with his mother and his step-siblings. But his, a lot of his siblings were like, who are you? What are you doing here? And so just grew up with a lot of confidence issues, self-image issues, all those kinds of things. And in fact, when he came to East Mountain, I was his mentor. And I remember in the early days sitting down with him, listening to him, and just having to strain because he talked like this and he could barely hear him. And yet over the course of of that year, Sia really began to find his voice, both literally and figuratively. And he really developed a passion to want to help other young people who were growing up like he did without a father. And so after Sia left East Mountain, he went to work with a ministry called Ambassador Soccer. And Ambassador Soccer has a ministry that equips coaches to be mentors and father figures for the boys that they're coaching. And so Sia went on to begin to to help other men and, and be involved in their training. Well, just this year, Sia was actually put into a leadership position, a regional position with this organization. And so now he's actually responsible for organizing training for coaches in a couple of cities in South Africa. And to see that development, how he's taking what he learned at East Mountain and being able to apply that on a much wider scale within this organization that is addressing the issue of fatherlessness. But there's another very exciting thing happening in the life of Sia. And that is Sia uh, is now engaged uh, to be married in April. 
But what's so exciting about that is that Sia is the first person in his family to be married. His relatives, when he told them he was getting married, they were like, what? You're doing what? What is that? Um, but Sia, as he was at East Mountain, interacting with, with godly husbands and fathers and, and seeing strong marriages, it gave him a different picture of how things could be. And he took the courageous step to get engaged. The Lord brought along a young woman who worked in another area uh, with this same ministry, and they were um, at a training together so that when they met and they you know, started corresponding and a relationship grew, and then Sia eventually recognized, hey, I think this is, this is the woman that God has for me. And so they'll get married in April. But again, to see God working in that way in the life of this young man. Another example of God working through the ministry of East Mountain, a young man named Lorenzo. He was one of our, he was a second year uh, of our internship. And Lorenzo was an 18, 19 year old, typical, um, but came into East Mountain not really knowing, you know, where he was headed in life, what he wanted to do. But over the course of his internship, discovered a real passion for God's word and a gift to teach and to help others understand. Well, the pastor at the church where he was doing his practical ministry recognized those same gifts in him. And so when Lorenzo finished at East Mountain, this pastor helped to send Lorenzo to Bible school so he could get some more Bible training. After Bible school, Lorenzo went back to that church to do a two-year internship uh, before he was ordained. Today, Lorenzo is actually the lead pastor of that church. The pastor who was there and who recognized his gifts is a church planner at heart. And so he is now back planting churches. And those leaders that I talked about that were working with them from the trek are leaders of this pastor um, for a church that he's planting. And so again, to see that coming full circle um, and to know that East Mountain had a small part to play in what God is doing. One of the things that we're really excited about this year, you know, East Mountain has been in existence for about 12 years. And over the course of that 12 years, we've always rented property, rented space to run our programs. But over the course of those 12 years, the, every year the price goes up. We've had to move three times, uh, either because the owners weren't taking care of the property and it reached a state where we just couldn't deal with it, or... The owner says, hey, we need this back, and so you guys need to hit the road. Um, but this year, God has given us an opportunity to actually purchase property for East Mountain. There was a couple that came uh, and worked for East Mountain for two years. They had been working in Zimbabwe with another mission and then came back to South Africa. The husband is Zimbabwean by birth. His mother is South African. Um, his wife is, is from the U.S., but so they came and worked with us for two years and then felt like the Lord was leading them to work more specifically with a church in Cape Town. And so because they were going to work with this church, they wanted to move closer to that church for their ministry. And so they offered us their property that they had purchased. And they're only asking for the amount that they invested into it, even though the market value is now higher than what they paid. And so not only are they offering it to us below market value, they are offering it to us to pay it over the next two years with no interest. This property has three buildings on it. It's got a, a big house, a smaller house, and then a cottage. We've already got two staff families living in the larger house and the smaller house, and we're going to use the cottage for our residency program, and then over time, we're hoping to expand that cottage to make it what we really want it to be. But the exciting thing, because it's got those two other buildings that we are able to rent, so our staff that are living there are paying rent, that it puts staff on the property, but then also it gives income to East Mountain that pays for taxes and maintenance and all of those kinds of things as well as puts a little bit back into the ministry 
to help run our programs. And so it's a really an opportunity that helps East Mountain to, to move to the next level of what God is inviting us to. And so really ask that you would pray for us, pray for East Mountain, pray for this project. Um, we're in the process right now actually of raising $30,000 for the deposit so that we can sign the purchase agreement and then over the next two years be able to get the rest that we need to pay for this. Um, but it's all about what Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful. There are people out there, the broken, the desperate, the grieving, the doubting and questioning. But the harvest is plentiful, and yet the workers are few. Let's pray. Dear Father, once again, we just thank you that you are God and that you are the Lord of the harvest. Father, thank you that you looked down and you saw each of us. And you drew us to yourself to bring us into your kingdom. But Father, you don't stop there. You invite us to join you in what you are doing in the world. Thank you, Lord, that that doesn't depend upon our own strength, on our own abilities. But you said it starts with you. Just coming before you, beseeching you to, to send forth workers. And that out of that space, out of that posture, sitting in your presence, Lord, you shape us. You transform us. You give us what we need so that we can go forth in your strength and use the gifts that you've given us to do the things that you've already prepared to be done. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to respond to your invitation to join you, knowing that you are our God and that you are with us and that you will do it. Father, thanks again for loving us so much and just for being present and doing your work in us. We thank you, and we love you. Amen.